Thank you so much. Okay, this is lovely. So, um, truly, truly thank you for coming out tonight. And um, given our size, I just want to throw it out there. If you do have questions along the way, please just ask me and we can have, even though this is like a very formal structure in which I am up here at a podium and you folks are sitting down, like let us sort of um, turn that on its head and have a conversation if you would like, or we could do that after as you wish. Um, so what I'm going to do this evening is go through three different works of mine and just talk about some, well, talk about how I came to um, No Pressure, No Diamonds, but also how I come to different works of mine. And uh, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do, or I'm going to try to do. Um, so before I, oh, sorry, I'm just going to go back for a second. Oh, I had all these thank yous. Oh, sorry, folks. I can see my slides. Okay, I, I lost my notes. Will you just, no, no, it's fine. I'll, bear with me. I'm just going to shut this down for one second and start again. Okay, so here we go and here we go. All right. Um, this was quite a large undertaking. It is my first public art project, and I'm used to working big. A lot of what I do are installations. Um, I reference sports a lot. Sports, you know, can be quite a large undertaking, so I'm not sort of scared by scale or size, but definitely this was a very large undertaking. So definitely I want to thank Iga for helping me through this, and also this project went through many different versions and many different iterations, and um, it is like a great curator that will sort of trust you as you move along, right, and not necessarily hold you to anything, but sort of trust the process. Um, I also want to thank Sheree Fawcett, who is sitting back there. Hello. Thank you so much for all your help in getting up on that ladder. Um, I'd like to thank Scott Lee, who helped design the publication, um, and Tim and Brian at Sign Design, who, who basically fabricated the vinyl hands that are on the 64 windows that are over, that are across the street. And I'd also like to thank Jeff Christie, Greg Hilker, Stephen Diefenbaker, Nathan Clorestra, and um, other people who are a part of um, Idea Exchange, like the sort of maintenance crew that helped install this work. And unfortunately, I don't have any images of the installation process, but they were, it was quite, um, yeah, an undertaking. And yeah, so I'm just gonna get started. So I thought a good way to start was to introduce um, the three sort of different aspects of my work that I keep returning to. And so that would be the body, sport, and gender and sexuality. And these are just kind of great examples um, of, from my sort of like research that uh, I thought would sort of introduce you to what I'm talking about. Um, so with regards to the body, I'm just gonna, go through a few things really quickly. This is Catherine Schweitzer. She was the first woman who ran the Boston Marathon as a tagged entrance, meaning she had like a number bib. Um, and so when I think of the body, I think of, you know, I think of movement. I think of, um, with this picture in particular, like the antagonisms that are a part of that. Um, bring this lady back. Um, I'm thinking of muscle, of bulk, of strength, what this woman's body in particular means, um, how we read it, if we still read it as feminine, um, and just what the presence of muscle can do on, on a woman's body. And this will sort of, I'll talk about this later on, but a project I worked on that I have been working on for this past year and a half is called Muscle Panic, and it very much speaks to sort of like the fear that muscle can, you know, um, bring up in us. And then um, this is an image of colon cancer. And um, I don't mean to bring it up lightly in any way, but a, a big part of my practice is about illness and disease and always having to do with like the intestines and Crohn's disease. Um, I won't talk about that so much today, but it felt disingenuous to talk about the body and not talk about this like, you know, this thing that is like very important to me in, in my work. Um, sport. This is a image that I return to many times because it kind of captures my interest in sport. So I'm interested in sport not necessarily for the, the, the competition and the, the meets that happen between different teams, but I'm interested in what happens surrounding those things. So how you get psyched up, how you get in the zone, the, the emotive kind of qualities of sport and what it means to play sports. Um, 
And this is another image that speaks to this interest in sport um, and team sports in particular, just sort of like the choreography that happens between bodies and the sort of um, this dance that happens when we come together and the ability of touching other people's bodies, right, in this sort of like non-sexual way, but this kind of, you know, yeah, this touch that does happen. Um, and yeah, basketball is sort of the, the sport that I reference a lot in my work. And this is a great picture that also speaks to sort of this, um, this world around competition that I'm really interested in with sports. And, you know, I would sum this up by just saying tenderness, right? And so whether that's between like a coach and a player or your different teammates, um, just the emotive quality of sports. Um, gender and sexuality. There we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. So some of you may know this. Um, this was a poster um, put out by ACT UP, which was the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power in March 1987. And it was produced by Grand Fury, who was the sort of design arm of that organization. And it was actually Avram Finkelstein who designed this one poster. So this was uh, a reaction to like the AIDS crisis that was happening um, in New York at the time. And yeah, I, I show you this because it brings up sort of queerness and, and sexuality and, and bodies and disease and illness, but also the, the pink triangle is something I kind of come back to many times in my, in my work and sort of try to think around it somehow and think about how we can insert ourselves, insert ourselves into these motifs. Um, this is a picture of Sheree Rose who was um, Bob Flanagan's partner, who's the gentleman who had cystic fibrosis, some of you may know. He had a movie, a documentary called Sick, that came out. Um, this is a photo from the March on Washington for lesbian, gay, and bi equal rights and liberation. And I bring this up, I show you this because it kind of speaks to my, my sort of niche interest in sexuality and just like leather community subcultures and just like how communities form and come together. And this is kind of this great picture that brings everything together, in my opinion. Um, it's an image of Pat Summit, who was the coach of the NCAA Lady Vols basketball team in Tennessee. And she had just given birth to her son, Tyler, and that's her partner. And um, this is just this magical photo of like this ambivalence that I think is really interesting with regards to like her as a mother, what the body goes through, her as a coach, and um, just as like a side note to this, um, this is like the unseen photo before the real photo. So the real photo is actually like the three of them having a very nice photograph. Um, so I, you know, I do not think this is the ambivalence, the Adrian Rich ambivalence that I kind of hope that Pat Summit was feeling. I think I'm just putting that on her, but still it is an image that I think can speak to a larger kind of discourse around bodies and women and motherhood. Um, and then just quickly, material culture. So while the three things I just sort of mentioned are sort of, um, you know, conceptually kind of what grounds my practice, um, material culture, and I'll sort of go through some images, is always what kind of ties it together, this real deep interest in the stuff that makes up our lives, that is around us. And by that, I mean, um, you know, the, the jacket he is holding, the banner in the top left corner, um, I mean, you know, ponytails and hair elastics, um, tools, DIY tools, do it yourself. This is like this brilliant sort of um, defensive guard that somebody's made out of like two by fours and um, some wood. And yeah, okay, so I thought there was an extra slide in there for a smooth transition, but I will go straight into this. This is the first piece I'm gonna talk about and it's called Intestinal Anarchy. Um, I installed it at AK Artist Run Center, and that was in 2013. So AK is in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Um, and I thought I would start off with this because this project really kind of touches on all those three sort of, that trifecta of interest that I just mentioned. Um, formally, just to kind of get it out of the way or to pay respect to it, um, the gallery was painted with a, a watered down latex, so it really has this kind of washed out watercolor look to it. And then I was there for five days and I painted sort of these intestines on the wall. So on the right hand side we have like a detail of what that looks like and then on the left hand side is just sort of a, a pulled back view of that. Um, and so I was really interested in sort of creating this like almost fantastical voyage um, nightmare of, you know, this kind of stadium 
this kind of gymnasium, but with your like your intestines sort of all around them. Um, to go back to this, I just want to sh sort of point out the raft. Oh gosh, I always get that wrong. If it's rafters or risers, I think it's rafters that were hanging down from the ceiling. And a lot of my work, and you know, when I talk about no pressure, no diamonds, I'll, I'll be talking about this too. But a lot of my work is done in response to sort of like the, the sort of architecture of the space or these these things that are already in the space. So um, when I saw that the gallery had this kind of um, these like rise rafters, sorry, these rafters coming from it, it jogged my memory and I was like, oh, there is, sorry, this like really great practice within stadiums of um, putting up sort of like retired athletes jerseys on these rafters and also of championship banners. So, oh, now I'm going back. So I was really interested in just kind of playing off of that. Um, so, to go to this, so what you're seeing here is that um, the first slide you saw were the front of the jerseys, these are the back of the jerseys, they're all hand cut, hand sewn, and I was really interested in um, a few things. One thing in particular is like sort of the absence of any kind of queer history of sport. And so in this project in particular is really kind of thinking about sort of, you know, sort of inserting, inserting a history there. and um, and. You've probably seen these before on a basketball player, or these kind of jerseys are quite quite normal. They've got the the name of the player usually. So I sort of just twisted that a little bit. And sometimes there's body organs, feelings. Um, we've got unrest, doubt, urgency, nipples, all talking to sort of like this kind of querying of this kind of history that exists to people, but not sort of within the popular culture. Um, and so this one I just showed you. This is a uh, detail of one of the banner, oh sorry, of one of the jerseys, and it's for Gertrude Stein, and she's somebody I come back to many, many times. Um, she is alive and well in No Pressure, No Diamonds, and I'll sort of, if you don't know who she is, I'll explain who she is in a little bit. Um, but I also wanted to point this out because there's sort of like the ACT UP pink triangle that I was speaking of, which, you know, we sort of all kind of understand is this um, gay pride and gay liberation symbol and motif, and I was really interested in sort of thinking through these symbols that kind of are meant to um, are meant to represent a community and how how that like how we can insert ourselves into that and um, so I was like great I'll just like you know these guts these spilled out guts so it's like for, for one sorry I'm, ugh, these spilled out guts I will leave it at that <laughs> Um, and I want to bring you to these two things. So throughout this talk, I'll sort of be going on these sort of like lateral tangents. Um, this button on the left was made by this woman on the right, Chris Birchall, who was an activist um, and worked for the body politic in Toronto, so a little bit of Toronto LGBT history. And in 81, there were the bathhouse riots. I don't know if any of you know about this, but basically the cops kind of like you know, had a riot, you know, sort of went into the bathhouses and um, arrested everyone. And so there was like a large outcry over that. And um, Chris Birchall came up with this button, this kind of motif and this slogan, no more shit. And I came across this, I think around the time I was working on intestinal anarchy. And so there's this real nice kind of conversation that I was trying to have with this past and how to kind of hold that past and hold that history and respect it and love it and like be tender with it, but also how to sort of like walk with it and move with it and to sort of once again, insert yourself into it. Um, and just like a nice little trajectory, this is um, my girlfriend's hand. She went to the CLGA, which is the Canadian Lesbian Gay Archives, during their um, <laughs> during their garage sale, and she bought up all their buttons for me. And she's like, "Look, look what I got you!" Because I was always afraid my button was going to fall off my jacket. And then um, I went ahead, and last year I drew a, a picture of this, a drawing of this, which is ink and watercolor. And this is also kind of indicative of my practice, where things. Um, there might be a larger, you know, installation that happens, but then there are always sort of these other smaller bits that kind of can disseminate in different ways than, let's say, a, a room full of jerseys and painted intestines. Um, the 
project that I've been working on for the last year and a half is called Muscle Panic. So this kind of refers back to that very muscular woman that I showed you a picture of um, early on. And Muscle Panic started in 2013 when I was asked by Mercer Union to do an offsite project in Workworth, Ontario, which is about like an hour and a half outside of Toronto near Coburg. Um, and, oh, I guess I decided to show you a little bit of research. So this is a, an archival image of like a, a men's basketball team and there's this practice of painting on the ball what your championship is or what your name is, the name of your team. And then there's also this really great picture which is a screen grab from a ESPN 30 on 30 um, documentary on Reggie Miller. And um, they were talking about Cheryl Miller who's Reggie Miller's sister and this was I guess from uh, news broadcast, so they're just like, unbelievable, women playing basketball. Um, and I just really liked that, and it really fed into sort of like how muscle panic sort of developed, at least aesthetically. Um, so I'll get back to muscle panic, the project, in a second. I just want to show you this first. So this is um, an archival image that I found in Shattering the Glass, The Remarkable History of Women's Basketball. And it's a picture of a women's basketball team at State Normal College in Greensboro, North Carolina. And when I first saw this, I was so taken with it. Um, the basketball net is like incredible. It looks like a Bauhaus object, like these angles and um, just like this very minimalist kind of hoop. And I was really taken by it. And also the height, you know, which is like way larger than any kind of basketball hoop that now sort of really exists. Um, and I was like, oh. How interesting, like maybe, maybe we can just insert a bit of like our queer history into this. Maybe let's just sort of think of a narrative that might, that might work. So um, with the help of my friend Sean Prosick, who um, works with wood a lot more than I do, we built this 16 foot maple um, basketball hoop that was really the centerpiece for muscle panic as it happened in Warkworth. So right here you can see sort of everything around the hoop is a barn um, and this barn is usually used for 4-H beef judging like once a year and otherwise it's pretty abandoned. And so when I was thinking about muscle panic the project I was thinking a lot about 4-H and what happens in sort of smaller rural communities and just sort of imagining you know um, Imagining like what you do as a queer kid if you are in that environment, like how do you find your people? How do you feel? How do you feel at one with yourself? Like how how do you search these things out? So I developed muscle panic in the Cow Palace as a way to sort of introduce that. So muscle panic developed as a rogue basketball team that would happen at night. Um, so this is uh, just a few slides of the banners that hung in the space. Um, just kind of like riffing on, you know, sports banners that you see in various stadiums, um, you know, satin, just things like that. And this is an image of the performance that happened in there. And this is, you know, maybe a bit of a bizarre image to show, but it's kind of good because you get the real scope of the space. So, you know. I was really interested in kind of like eking out a small part of this huge barn to use for these like, you know, scandalous isn't the right word, but these sort of, you know, when you've got this rogue, you know, coming together of people. Um, and this is an image from one of the performances and the performance was 30 minutes long. It started with a 5K run that all the performers went on and part of that was um, I was performing with non-performers. So I was performing, my sister was there, um, and friends were performing with me. So by going on this run, I was interested in the endorphin rush that a run provides your body with, right? And how you always feel like a little bit invincible after running a 5K or however long you run. And I was also, you know, it's this idea of enacting what I was actually interested in. And I'm interested in like these warm, sweaty, muscular bodies. I'm, you know, and I was like, well, you know, instead of just, you know, pointing to these things, how about we are these things? How about we walk through those barn doors and we are those warm, sweaty bodies? Um, and this is another image. Um, it's my sister and I she's braiding my hair. So kind of what I was talking about at the beginning about um, 
this project and my interest being about not the actual competition and not the actual playing of the sport, but all the things that kind of happen around it. So muscle panic is a great example of that because that hoop that I showed you was never actually played with. It was more of a memento. It was almost a bit of an altar. Um, and in, yeah, so in this case, like, you know, we're doing those things you would do with your teammates, braid our hair, we're practicing, we're sitting, we're breathing, we're just, you know, gaining our composure after this run. Um, and then the very last thing we did on, with that performance is that we reenacted this moment. And this is this great thing that happened in which Diana Taurasi and Simone Augustus, who also factors in the show that's across the street, um, kiss. And I don't have it for you right now. I just thought I'd show you like a, a screen grab, but it's a very innocuous kiss. It's like they've known each other for years. They've played, like the WNBA is a very small, you know, organization. Um, and when you're an elite athlete as a woman basketball player, like you know your colleagues very well. Um, but it's this beautiful moment in which everyone's fear of athletic women being lesbians is like made real. You know, which it isn't necessarily, but it's just this beautiful moment that happens in culture, like that happened, that circulated, that exists, um, in which like our worst fears come true, but they're not our worst fears. That's something else. Um, and so I'm gonna bring you here next. And so this is um, at the McLaren, which is in Barrie, Ontario. And I was invited to do another iteration of Muscle Panic. Um, and so that's my team on the left-hand side. And I wanted to show you these pictures together because once again, like material culture and sort of what circulates and this kind of like image-based research that I do is always very present. And so these are the Seattle Sea Baskets of uh, Eugene, Oregon. This is from 1979. And so like we're very just like sartorially, you know, inspired by this team. Um, and so the project happened outside in their courtyard where the hoop was installed and then I was also installed in one of their galleries that I turned into um, a locker room, like a women and trans locker room. So these are a few images and I wanted to show you these also in particular because these are the shirts, these are the uniforms that we were wearing to play you know, to do our performance in. So um, I'm just interested in sort of like the slipperiness of these objects, how they function as sculpture, they function as uniform, and then they also function as sculpture again, right? That's them on the right-hand side, that's them in the corner once being worn. So after the opening night when we had the performance, um, they were left all sweaty in a pile. So just, yeah, that sort of like slipperiness for lack of a better word. Um, this is another image of the space. This is another image in these lockers. I, I like showing this because that sort of middle panel that says Ass Master. Um, I bought these lockers from just outside of Barrie. There's a car plant that had just closed and so they were selling their lockers off and so these were like, you know, directly from the locker rooms of this uh, assembly plant, which I kind of loved. Um, and then these are just two images of what the the basketball hoop looked like outside. And just one last thing to kind of reiterate the, the, the uselessness, if I could say that, of the sculpture as a tool. The, um, the hoop has just been like, you know, sort of knotted into itself. So it kind of functions more as a catch as opposed to something for the ball to come through. So, um, you know, I was really interested in really driving that home that this isn't meant as a tool, this is more meant to, as something to be with. Um, and this is an image from our performance. And then this is another image of our performance. And the reason I wanted to show you this, because I think what we're doing in the background just nicely kind of goes back to what I was talking about is these bodies touching in this kind of choreography. Um, so the last sort of iteration I did of Muscle Panic happened at Scrap Metal, which is in Toronto, sort of in the West End, and it happened this past summer. I was there for three months. They gave it to me as a, a residency to do as I wished, and I was like, great, this is wonderful. Um, the space is very, it used to be like a marble um, factory workshop in which they'd make like marble tabletops and things like that, and a few doors down it still exists as that, so there's this nice sort of industrial quality to the space. And I was really wanting to, 
continue muscle panic, right? But just a very different sort of iteration of it. And I started thinking about muscle panic as this umbrella. It's like, or this, this way of working, as opposed to being like a final project, muscle panic is a way of working. And always in this muscle panic way of working, a certain kind of like, 20th century feminism is being used and it's being paired with another kind of sport or you know, some sort of athletic feat. And in this version in particular, I was interested in radical feminism, so sort of this kind of separatist, we need to be separated from, you know, women need to be alone. And I was thinking about um, gymnastics and Bella Caroli, who is Nadia Comaneci's coach. Um, so I was just thinking about these things, like kind of, kind of disparate, kind of out there, but you know, sometimes when you tease enough at things, they kind of come together. You start to see their similarities, and I always appreciate that as like a, a way of working through things. Um, this is another image of it. So we've got this main sort of structure here, which is a balance beam, um, which was made uh, timber framed, meaning there's no screws or nails. It can all be sort of taken apart just with. Um, just with a hammer, really, just with like a, a mallet. Uh, and I think I'll show that in a little bit. Um, and then there was a scaffolding that I was really interested in working with. And um, because I was there for three months, the space really kind of functioned as a studio and as a place for the work to develop and not just this final um, installation. Um, so there are the mallets and put the balance beam together. And the reason I was really interested in the scaffolding is because the, I've got a few images that I, I, once again, return to many times. And this is, you know, a picture of Jordan back in the day, you know, back before these kind of mechanized, um, these kind of digital, you know, arms that have cameras on them that could take this kind of image. Like it really was just like, let's load the scaffold up and let's take that, you know, that like money shot from above, and I just love this kind of, um, this kind of like the epitome of skill, right? Michael Jordan, and then this like really clunky, very regular painter's scaffolding beside it. I was really interested in that kind of, um, that relationship. And then this is another one too, just like a, a shot from above before a game's supposed to start. You know, you say, you know, the niceties to the other, to the other team. Um, and then this is a picture of the balance beam taken from the scaffolding. So you've got that kind of um, that kind of perspective that I was interested in, and also one of the reasons I was interested in that perspective because you know it kind of related back to the basketball hoop from the first muscle panic, and I kind of really you know was excited about this this the, the creation almost of like these these tools and these objects that are meant to be used but never meant to be used in the way that you would assume it would. Like that, you'll see, I'll show you a video in a second, but like that, that beam was never meant to have like an Olympic gymnastics routine on it. You know, it's meant to be engaged as, as you wish. It's meant to be sort of like field out. And um, same with the basketball hoop. It was meant to be sort of, it was meant to represent something other than the shooting of hoops and the winning of games, right? So once again, trying to like disidentify with competition, I suppose, amongst other things. Um, so the next thing I'm gonna show you is a video and it's only a minute long and um, this was from Scrap Metal, um, the opening night. <laughs> So 
The next sort of version, the next iteration of Muscle Panic I'll be doing is in Vancouver in the winter. And yeah, I'm excited to sort of see where it goes. And I, I think, you know, this way of working in which, I don't know, I don't want to say that nothing's ever done, but just like that you kind of carry sort of this idea through along with like the forms. And just saying that, I'm like, oh, I guess lots of people do that. But I tend to call the thing the same thing, which doesn't always work for grants, but yeah. <laughs> it's a reality. Um, so no pressure, no diamonds. This is the project that is across the street. And um, yeah, so this project developed very much in relationship to the space, right? Um, so the windows and um, just like the, the height of the space. And you know, when I was thinking about, because I guess I can't, I don't know how long we've been working on this, but close to a year perhaps, you know, it's sort of been in the works. Um, you know, I went through many different ideas and I was just, you know, thinking of things that kind of related to Cambridge and things that related, you know, to the building and the space. And I think in the end, that's kind of what won out is just kind of what you were talking about, Ega. Like, it's this beautiful juncture and it's this beautiful coming together of like this library and this art gallery and what happens in those two places um, and why that's interesting and why that's interesting to me in my art practice. And I was really trying to find sort of a way to kind of bring those things together. Um, this is a picture of Vermont in the winter on the left hand side. So that's Johnson, Vermont, where like the Vermont Studio Center is, which is like a residency place in, in the States. And I was there, when was I there? In 2014 for four weeks um, in March. And I was there to work on a comic book and I never got it done, um, which is totally fine because lots of good stuff happened in place of it. And one of them was meeting this fellow who's Ross Gay, who's the person I collaborated on the, the publication with. And I met him like the first day I was there and um, I had just started, I guess, like training for basketball as opposed to playing, meaning like I was, I had a very like specific, very particular sort of set of drills that I would go through every time I played, right? And uh, I was really looking to get better. <laughs> like having played just in, gosh, I guess elementary school, like I kind of went through all my life being like, yeah, yeah, I'm a good player. And then, you know, you have this kind of awful realization one day where I'm like, oh, I'm really bad actually. Um, so going to Vermont, I had intended to work on this comic book, but also I wanted like my shot and my left hand dribble to get a lot better. So. You know, the comic book didn't get done, but all the other things did. So I met this fellow, Ross Gay, and we immediately hit it off. We became really good friends, and we played basketball like two or three hours every day at the university that was kind of on the hill. And um, a few things about, yeah, gosh, where to start? So I'll this is a little drawing I made from him. I thought it kind of introduced a few things nicely. So basically, No Pressure, No Diamonds is a quote from Thomas Carlyle, who was a Scottish essayist, satirist, historian, um, who worked during the Victorian era. There's no reason you should know that. Um, the reason you might know No Pressure, No Diamonds is because this fellow, Robert Griffith III, um, who's a NFL football player, um, I don't exactly know what he was, what was happening in his career at the time, but Adidas came out with an ad campaign, and they kind of coined, they they took it from you know Thomas Carlyle. They did as people do these days. They reblogged, you know, they um, they took no pressure, no diamonds, and they sort of associated it with Robert Griffith Jr. or sorry, the third, and that's where these socks come from. So I purchased those socks on Boxing Day. Um, a few years ago, not knowing what the reference was, but enjoying it. And so when I went to Vermont, I had these socks. And I would play, I would use them, I would wear them while I was playing basketball. Um, and these, is this is this beautiful moment of serendipity. I think um, Ross like had two pink stud diamond earrings in his ears, right? And it's just, you know, I think what I really love about what has come of this project, No Pressure, No Diamonds, is that these really kind of insignificant things like socks and studs and, you know, playing basketball, not insignificant to some, but um, have really just kind of become the core of this, like, really, this project that I'm really kind of interested in and fond of. Um, so while I was in Vermont, um, I was just kind of working through a few things. So I was doing a bunch of drawings that kind of referenced 
various people and things. I was drawing a lot of hands. I was a bit stuck on this comic book that I was talking about, so my go-to was always to draw hands. Um, I think I like the irony of a still hand and my moving hand and my brain that's not quite sure what to do always. And then I started drawing these hands. And what these hands are, are a diagram of this shot. So once you've, proper basketball form is once you've like, it's a jump shot or just a free throw. Um, proper form is you've got your guide hand and then your follow through hand. And if you played at any point in your life, especially in elementary school, you might remember the sort of reaching for the cookie and the cookie jar. It's like this kind of real sort of limp wrist almost. Um, so I was learning a lot of that playing with Ross because I had a really bad shot. So that was something we were going over and over and over again. Um, it's kind of repetition that any kind of skill acquisition requires, right? So for those of you who haven't seen it, this is an image of what's next door or what's across the street, I should say. So it's this image, it's this drawing and um, I think they're not all, they're not all different, but they're, um, I think there's about 23 or so drawings for the 64 windows. So on each window, there's a set of these hands. And as you look at them, it really kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of this like the shot that we've done over and over and over again. Um, this is, you can't really see the hands in this image, but I just wanted to show it to you to sort of get an idea of like the scope of how the hands would sort of relate to, um, relate to the space and just a bit on the left you can see one of the banners and this is a better shot of the banner so you've got one huge banner that's Gertrude Stein and Simone Augustus playing horse and then you've got um, the middle banner which says insistence I think it's 13 times and then the other one the one on the left says repetition um, and then to introduce these two so Simone Augustus plays for the Minnesota Lynx, WNBA. Their team just won the WNBA playoffs. She was also the one who was in that sort of like kiss that I showed you with Diana Taurasi. Um, she just got married to her wife a little while ago or to her girlfriend who is now her wife. Um, and then on the right hand side, we've got Gertrude Stein, Alice Toglas and Basket, their dog. And for those of you who aren't too familiar with Gertrude Stein, um, she was a poet, a writer. She held the salons. Um, in Paris, um, she's an American, but then moved to Paris, you know, sort of mingled with the likes of like Picasso um, and all those folks. And her writing is really like a minimalist writing with like quite often disregard to punctuation and to sort of contextualize her very easily, like she's very well known for a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose, um, which I think speaks very much, very well to um, what her writing is sort of like. And one of my favorite um, books of hers is Lectures in America. So it's a bunch of lectures that she gave in America. And in Portraits and Repetition, which is one of the essays, she's got this quote that I absolutely adore. Um, and I'm gonna read it to you. Then also there's the important question of repetition and is there any such thing? Is there repetition or is there insistence? I'm inclined to believe there's no such thing as repetition. And really, how can there be? And I came across this, I think it was in 2008, and at that time, I was doing my MFA, and I was really, you know, interested in sort of, you know, thinking through sports. Um, but thinking through sports with regards to textiles, for many years I had designed textile fabric in Montreal, I'd made, you know, um, Textiles was always a really important part of what I did, and I think a huge part of textile making is like this kind of repetition, right? It's doing the same thing over and over again, and, um, Back in 2008, when I came across this quote, I was like, oh, so is so, so, is so many kinds of skill acquisition. Um, it's doing the same thing over and over again. But I think what I love so much about this quote is that I was like, oh, but it's never doing the same thing over and over again. There's like, it will never be the same thing over and over again. And I think that's where I thought about insistence, right? Or to insist upon something, it, it just like, there was like this emotive quality to it that I was interested in. Um, yeah, so with the project at um, across the street, my intention, you know, I think what I really wanted to do was to create this kind of trifecta, right? So you've got this object right here, which has all of our publications, and we sort of retrofitted a snapped Cambridge um, newspaper stand, and this is meant to be taken, to be taken away, um, and in it you've got... Um, these hands, and I think once again, there's like 20, 
20 hands and these drawings, all the same drawing, not all the same drawing, and text, and the text all refers to different kinds of um, basketball drills, ways of being, ways of enacting, you know, ways of being in your body to sort of, you know, be prepared for this ball. Um, but once again, like the ball doesn't actually come up in any of this, like the ball is never present, right? And once again, I think it's this desire to kind of like push away from, you know, competition and, and that being all we think about when we think about sports. Um, so you've got the hands and then you've got these banners and then, um, and then this part. And, you know, yeah, so just to go back to what I was saying before, a big part of it was just this response to... Um, the space and the architecture, but also I think how we come to ideas, how we come to knowledge, how we, you know, not only how we perfect our jump shot, but how we read through a book or how we think through an idea, it, it really is about this kind of like insistence and this kind of returning to and, and coming again. And um, in particular, I was really interested in Simone Augustus and Gertrude Stein and kind of bringing them together in this like huge, I think it's 10 by 10 feet um, banner. And, you know, Ego's kind of mentioned like, oh, people won't know who they are. You know, what is that? And, and I know there's always this fear of something being a bit too like inside baseball where it's like you have to be in the know to like get something. And I, I, I just love that it's in a library, and that is what we do in a library when we don't know something, or that is what we once did in a library, and we do many things in a library now, but like we go there when we don't know the answer to something, and hopefully, you know, amongst people and machines and all these different tools, like we come to that answer. So um, this like, m you know, kind of dream, this sort of dream meeting of these two women, one being historical, one being present day, like this meeting that will never happen, this meeting that I would imagine, like what would they talk about, you know, having Gertrude Stein and this kind of repetition in her writing and Simone Augustus and this repetition in just how she functions in the world, what her career is, like what her skill is, like what kind of conversation could be had there. And also, um, they're playing horse and I, you know, I just to, you know, bring you into sort of my thought process, like I went through many different sort of versions of what it could be and I settled on horse because partly the absurdity of it, you know, it's, it kind of reminded me of something Gertrude Stein might write, but also, you know, I think horse is under, there's enough understanding with horse, like I think enough of us have played horse or it is like within the the playground kind of vocabulary enough that I was sort of banking on it not being too insider baseball. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess the last thing I was here to show you was these are, uh, this is a spread from the publication. And, you know, I think also in just like the lack of a lot of text, it kind of asks you to sort of sit with it in this different way, you know, and um, not in this way in which you're sort of, you know, there's a lot of text for you to absorb, but just for you to sort of, I don't know, just kind of be with it. It's a little bit more subtle, a little bit poetic. Um, yeah, and I think, I think that's everything. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much.